Thank you for choosing Lawline to fulfill your CLE requirements, and welcome to this audio seminar. A verification code word will be played during the program. In order to receive credit for this course, you will need to enter the code word in lowercase online. We hope you enjoy this program, and thank you for choosing Lawline. Good morning, and welcome to Introduction to Music Law. I'm Mark Ostro. I'll be your host this morning, uh, and I hope to get through a uh, fairly detailed presentation this hour. Um, I am a copyright and entertainment lawyer here in New York City with a focus in the music business. I'm also an adjunct uh, professor at Cardozo Law School, where I have taught music law since 2017. And uh, any other uh, information about my background, such as where I went to school, spoiler alert, uh, University of Pennsylvania and University of Chicago Law School, uh, you can look at my website and there will be the link to the website in the slides. So let us begin. Of course, there is the standard disclaimer. This is for information only. It's not a substitute for legal advice, but since you folks uh, watching the presentation are lawyers, you know this. So let's proceed. So we're going to try to cover a whole bunch of topics today. And we're going to start with a little bit of a copyright review for those of you who are familiar with copyright law, or per perhaps are copyright practitioners in areas outside of music. Uh, for others, it will be a bit of a primer on some basic copyright principles because to a large extent, music law is applied copyright law. And we'll go into the uh, main aspects of the music business, the music publishing business and music publishing agreements, the record industry uh, and recording agreements. We'll talk about the recently enacted Music Modernization Act. And we'll finish with uh, a bit about music clearances, how you uh, obtain licenses for the use of music in various projects. So some basic copyright principles. Uh, copyright is mandated in the United States Constitution. In fact, the first Copyright Act was enacted in the very first Congress in 1790. That's how important our founders thought copyright was. And the current Copyright Act is uh, 17 United States Code, Section 101. So when do you get a copyright? Uh, copyright uh, protects original works that are fixed in a tangible medium, to borrow the language of the statute. So as soon as you put the pen down, or you hit save, or you hit print, you have a copyright. You don't have to register with the copyright office to have copyright. So what can be copyrighted? What can be protected by copyright? Most important is that it is original, and that is an expression of the author or creative. It's non-utilitarian. You can't copyright a, uh, a water pitcher, for example, but you can copyright the design on the water pitcher. And as I said, it has to be fixed in a tangible medium. So original creative expression. It doesn't have to be novel. It just has to have a modicum of creativity. This was explained by the Supreme Court in the Feist uh, case that had to do with a, the telephone book where the Supreme Court held that a mere alphabetical uh, compendium of uh, telephone numbers and addresses was not uh, sufficiently original and it got rid of the sweat of the brow doctrine. So that has, that's the first aspect. So what can't be protected by copyright? Inventions, that's the domain of patent. Short phrases, titles and names, ideas and concept, uh, facts, slogans, familiar symbols. So let's talk about ideas and concepts in the music content, context and scenes affair. Uh, this is best explained by example. For example, if you have a uh, Western movie and, you're, uh, and you show a scene of a cowboy on a horse with a uh, uh, the, the wide-brimmed hat riding off into the sunset, that is a scene affair. You can't copyright that. That is something that is standard uh, depiction as part of the genre of Westerns. So what are some ideas and concepts that you can't copyright in music? 
Generally, you can't copyright uh, chord progressions. Those of you who are musicians may know the circle of fifths chord progression or falling thirds chord progression. Falling thirds is basically every uh, doo-wop song from the 1950s. You can't copyright song titles, that sort of thing. Um, you can't copyright a genre or a groove or a feel. You can copyright individual beats, but you can't copyright um, say, uh, for those of you who are jazz uh, fans, the, the spangalang ding 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 on the hi-hat. That's just endemic to the genre. So, you have a copyright. You've hit save, you put the pen down. What rights does a copyright holder have? Copyright Act Section 106 provides the bundle of rights. Um, and those are listed on the slide. The right to reproduce the work and distribute it, one and three. The right to publicly perform the work. Uh, the right to display the work generally applies to works of visual art such as paintings, photographs, and sculptures. And as we'll discuss later this hour, there is a very limited right to publicly perform a sound recording as opposed to a musical work. Going back to uh, section 102 of what is copyrightable, among the things that are copyrightable are musical works and sound recordings. So one of the rights that a copyright holder has is the right to create a derivative work. What's a derivative work? It's defined in section 101 and as you can see among the things that are contained in the laundry list are musical arrangements. For example, if a work was originally uh, uh, a pop tune and you uh, arrange it for uh, a vocal choir, soprano, alto, tenor, baritone, that is an arrangement. If a work was originally for orchestra and you arrange it for concert band, that's an arrangement. That's a derivative work. A recording of a song technically is a derivative work of that song. How long does a copyright last? So ever since the current Copyright Act went into effect, on January 1, 1978. It's life of the author plus 70 years. Uh, if you don't know the author, then it's 95 years from publication or 120 years from uh, uh, creation, which is ever shorter. What if there's multiple authors? It's the life of the last living author. So if you are writing works, I suggest that you uh, have uh, your grandchild as your co-author so that your copyright lasts as long as possible. So pre-1978, there was a different system. There was an initial term and a renewal term, and the works had to be renewed. And those works generally lasted uh, for, for 95 years. We recently um, are having works now enter the public domain where we hadn't had works enter the public domain for a while. Do I need to register with the Copyright Office? As I said, you have a copyright as soon as it's fixed in a tangible medium. But there are certain built-in statutory incentives in the Copyright Act that make it very advisable and desirable to register your copyright. And first of all, you can't sue unless you have a copyright registration. And we'll get back to that in a second. And it provides uh, prima facie evidence of the validity of the facts stated in the copyright registration. What's stated in the copyright registration? Among other things, the person or persons who created the work, who the initial copyright holder of the work is, the date the work was created, and of course, as we'll see on the next slide, uh, one of the things that you have to submit with your copyright application is the deposit copy of what the work actually is in addition to the application. So it provides a no later than creation date, and there was recently a Supreme Court decision from last year as to fulfilling the uh, statutory requirement of having a registration, whether you have to have the actual piece of paper from the Copyright Office, the actual registration with the registration number, or the mere filing of the application is sufficient. Uh, in a unanimous decision, the Supreme Court said you have to actually have the registration. 
This uh, can be important for statute of limitations concerns because it can take up to nine months from the time you submit an application even online to the time you get your registration certificate. I uh, wrote a blog post about the benefits of legislation. It's available on my website. You see the, uh, uh, the URL there. So how do I get a copyright registration? Best way is do it online at copyright.gov. As I stated, there are three parts, the application, the deposit copy, and of course, the fee for the registration. And under certain circumstances, you can register multiple works. Uh, under certain circumstances, you can register both the copyright in the musical work and a copyright in the sound recording of that work in the same uh, registration. There are a series of free pamphlets called circulars that are available on the Copyright Office website that provide some guidance for uh, you or your clients for doing copyright registrations. Unlike a trademark or patent registration, copyright registrations are often very simple and relatively inexpensive, a $55 application, and very often the individual creators can do it themselves. Who owns the copyright? Well, as soon as you fix it in a tangible medium, it vests in the creator or creators of the work. And of course, you can transfer copyright, but that has to be done in writing uh, by generally a copyright assignment. Uh, there are no exceptions. Of course, this is the law. There's always exceptions uh, by operation of law. For example, if one of you uh, were to write uh, a song and you don't assign it to anybody and you die intestate, the copyright passes to your statutory heirs by operation of law. So let's talk about joint works. Let's use the example Jack and Jill writing a song. And I've written a blog post about this copyright colla uh, conundrums for collaborators for more information on this. So Jack writes the music, Jill writes the lyrics. And as you see the definition of joint work, the key thing about a joint work is there has to be intent to create the work. So if I were to take a pre-existing poem, say something that's still under copyright by E.E. E. Cummings, for example, that can't be a joint work. There's no intent there. It's a pre-existing work. That would have to be licensed by the copyright owner of that text. So you have the intent. They create a joint work. Who owns what? As I said, Jack wrote the music. Jill wrote the lyrics. And the answer is they each own an undivided 50% interest in both the lyrics and the music, even though one author solely wrote one and the other author solely wrote the other. Copyright law is generally referred to as a branch of intellectual property, and a lot of intellectual property principles are um, analogized from real property principles. So let's say Jack and Jill bought a house. They have the right to each occupy the whole house. It's not like unless they entered into some weird agreement that Jack has the uh, ground floor and the backyard and Jill has the top floor and the front yard. They have access to all of the work. So even if they didn't contribute to both the music and the lyrics, they're joint owners. And the default provision is it's a uh, pro rata share regardless of contribution, unless modified by written agreement. So if you have four authors, and very often in a lot of popular genres today, you can have a half a dozen authors. Somebody's writing the lyrics, somebody's writing the top line, somebody's doing the beats, and uh, the producer has a share. Everybody in the room has a piece. So again, it has to be modified by written agreement. Some people uh, are uh, entitled to a larger share certainly by virtue of bargaining power. And in the music industry, we have what's called a split sheet, which has the royalty uh, uh, provisions as to who has what share, 15%, 10%, 20%. And it can be just a very short piece of paper with the names of the creators uh, and their percentage of ownership in the work, and they sign it. And it's very important because if you register with 
a music publisher or any licensing collectives, you have to have all the shares registered or there will be problems getting paid your royalties. So joint owner over work, let's say Jill is very good at business and Jack isn't, Jill does a deal to license the song to uh, Burger King. Does she have to get Jack's permission to do that? In the absence of a written agreement to the contrary, no. She has an undivided interest in the work. She can license the whole work, uh, non-exclusively, but she has to account to Jack for his 50% share. So that is joint works, and in the songwriting context, the concept of joint works and the need for split sheets is very important. Work for hire. Work for hire comes up most uh, of the time in the music context for commissioned works and for artists under a recording contract. So sometimes an employer will uh, own a work or a commissioner will own the work. In the music biz, generally songwriters are not employees of uh, music publishers and artists are not employees of record labels, so this doesn't really apply. So when you're dealing with independent contractors, it has to fall within one of the nine categories listed in section 101 with, uh, that defines what can be a work made for hire under the Copyright Act. First of all, it has to be by written agreement and it has to be within one of the specified categories. And note that sound recording is not one of the nine categories. So the record labels for time immemorial, ever since the record industry came into being, have always maintained that the works recorded by recording artists are works for hire. How do they do that? One of the categories is a compilation. So if you're recording an album, they claim that the compilation is a work for hire. So what if in this day and age where albums aren't necessarily released or at least singles are released months or even a year ahead of time, is that a work for hire? Well, that may be something that may be litigated at some point. Copyright infringement. That's the test for what you have to prove the elements of copyright infringement, a valid copyright, uh, evidence of copying. You usually don't have direct evidence. You're not watching somebody actually copy a work. So if there's access, for example, if somebody is alleging that their song is ripped off and it's a hit song that's alleged to be ripped off, very often access can be inferred. And we've seen this in the Blurred Lines case where the Marvin Gaye estate sued uh, Pharrell and uh, Robin Thicke, we've seen this in the Stairway to Heaven case, we've seen this in a bunch of Ed Sheeran cases. So you have to prove access and substantial similarity of copyrightable elements. Remember we talked about some things that aren't copyrightable, like chord changes, song titles, and the like. You can have a copyrightable arrangement or amalgamation of non-copyrightable elements. For example, if you have, um, say, a chord progression that isn't copyrightable, uh, but it's uh, unique to that melody, of course, then that's part of what is copyrightable. Um, that uh, is based upon uh, what the ordinary observer sees. We could talk about copyright infringement cases uh, for the rest of the hour, but time is short. But one thing that is important in these copyright infringement cases is the distinction between pre-1978 works and post-1978 works. Remember, we talked about with a copyright registration, you have to have a deposit copy. Prior to 1978, musical works, you could only submit sheet music, printed music. If it's an orchestral work, you're submitting a full score, that's not a problem. With pop songs such as Marvin Gaye or Stairway to Heaven or Beatles songs, what frequently happened is what was submitted was not a full realized written out arrangement of what was performed on the record, but a lead sheet which consists of the melody line, the lyrics written underneath, and the chord symbols for what 
harmonies go under there. So the bass line, the drum pattern, uh, the keyboard comping, a lot of that wouldn't be included in a lead sheet. So it becomes an issue in these infringement cases, what is the work that is alleged to be infringed? Defenses to infringement. Independent creation doesn't happen that often, but it can. Uh, let's skip statute of limitations for a minute. License, I had permission to use this work, so I'm not infringing. Failure to register, you can't sue for copyright infringement if you don't have the registration uh, certificate. De minimis use, it's such a small amount of the allegedly infringing work that the courts don't recognize it as infringement. Fair use we'll talk about in a second. The DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, if you are an online service provider, for example, if you're like YouTube where users uh, upload their own content and somebody claims that their work is infringed, there is this provision in the DMCA Section 512 called Notice and Takedown. So if the uh, online service provider such as YouTube receives a takedown notice and they take down the work, they're not liable for any uh, copyright infringement as long as they comply with other statutory factors. Again, we could talk uh, for over an hour about the DMCA and how that has been applied over the last 20 years. Um, statute of limitations. It's three years, but for, a lot, but for copyright infringement, it's a rolling statute of, infringe, statute of limitations, which is why after 50 years, you can have a lawsuit for copyright infringement involving the song Stairway to Heaven. You can't go back and get all 50 years of uh, royalties if you are successful, but you can go back for the three prior years prior to filing the lawsuit, and with an evergreen standard like Stairway to Heaven, that's still going to be a lot of money. However, if you are claiming ownership, that is more of a hard stop and that statute of limitations can easily uh, uh, bar you from uh, proving ownership after three years from when the claim accrued. So to practitioners, you may have to carefully plead your um, copyright uh, case, whether it's infringement or ownership. Let's talk about fair use. Fair use is defined in section 107 of the Copyright Act and while some commentators talk about fair use rights, fair use is a defense to copyright infringement. And it's use of another's work or portion of a work for purposes such as commentary, criticism, news reporting, etc. So there are four statutory factors. And what I like to say when I talk to my students is that everything that you think about the thing you know about fair use is wrong. In the music context, there are all these um, uh, rumors about fair use that are out there. For example, if I only use 10 seconds, it's fair use, or if I only use 30 seconds, it's fair use, or if I only use four bars or four measures of a song, it's fair use. There are no hard and fast rules. If anybody tells you if it's a, under a certain amount of time or a certain number of measures, uh, in, a, in a song, they're wrong. It's always determined on a case-by-case -case basis by applying the four statutory factors. And the leading case in this area is Campbell v. A. Cuff Rose, which was a parody case uh, where two live crew parodied the, the Roy Orbison hit, Oh Pretty Woman. And there was talk about transformative use. They used, the parody was not taking the actual work to um, substitute for the original Roy Orbison hit, but it was using it for another purpose. So parody is specialized. For example, you can't just write new lyrics to the entire song. What about Weird Al? Well, he gets permission. For parody, you can only use a portion of the work to conjure up the original, and then you have to use original content, and the parody has to comment on the underlying work. It can't just be uh, funny lyrics about something else. So 
that is a brief uh, primer on fair use. I've written blog posts on fair use and transformative use as applied in the uh, music context uh, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that. Now, let's talk about the, the meat of the matter. There are two different copyrights that we generally talk about in the music business. Copyright in the underlying composition and copyright in a sound recording. Musical compositions, aka songs, aka musical works, are created by a songwriter or songwriters who write the music and lyrics to the song. And the song is usually owned by one or more music publishers. That's contrasted with a sound recording, which is a master recording of a song, and that is done by a recording artist and is customarily owned by a record label and rights in songs and rights in recordings are handled by different entities as we will see shortly. Uh, the best way to uh, discuss the difference between copyright in a musical composition and copyright in the sound recording is by example. Um, when I was in high school, I wasn't a very good math student, and uh, my brother, who was a math whiz, would tutor me, and being the good older brother that he was afterwards, he would take me to the Yankee games. And whenever the Yankees uh, played a game, at the end of the game, they always performed the song New York, New York, which is a copyrighted song by John Kander and Fred Ebb. And when they won, they would play the Sinatra recording, and when they lost, at least back then, they don't do this anymore, they played the Liza Minnelli recording. What they had against Liza at the time, I don't know, but that's the example of one copyrighted song, two different sound recordings. Another example, Carol King wrote uh, You've Got a Friend. She recorded it on her Tapestry album, but it was James Taylor who had a big hit with the song when he recorded it. So, as I said, music... Uh, Songs are represented by music publishers. What does a music publisher do? It owns or administers the copyrights. Basically, they exploit the Section 106 rights in copyrights in songs principally by licensing them. And they work with what we call the performing rights organizations and other licensing collectives. So, what are music publishing companies? They are the big majors, Sony ATV, Warner Chapel, and Universal music uh, group, there are independents, and then there are administrators, which we'll talk about uh, in, a, in a minute in more detail. But an administrating uh, copyright uh, music publisher is one that doesn't own the copyrights, but signs an agreement with the copyright owner, which could be a songwriter or another music publishing company, to handle all the licensing of the Section 106 rights. So why do you use a publishing company? If you're a songwriter, to handle the business, to handle the advances, to make sure you get paid when your uh, song is a hit in foreign territories, in England, in Japan, in uh, China, and all sorts of uh, fun places. So, major sources of publishing income. The most important one these days, especially since uh, streaming has been so dominant and continues to be dominant, is public performance income. And that's fees collected from playing songs on the radio and TV, in concert halls, in bars and restaurants, wherever you hear music. Um, the second most important is mechanical royalties. That's recordings to use a song and record it in an audio-only sound recording. So CDs, LPs, downloads, that's mechanical royalties. Back before the turn of the current century, that used to be the biggest piece of the pie. It's now performance income, which is well north of 50% of a music publisher's income and therefore a songwriter's income. The other two, synchronization income, the synchronization refers to, or sync income refers to income for use of music that is synchronized to audiovisual works such as using songs in film, TV, advertising, video games, any kind of audiovisual works. Music publishing, of course, started in Tin Pan Alley with sheet music, but sheet music 
arrangements like band and choral arrangements and permissions like lyric reprints and the like now are less than 10% of what a music publisher and songwriter generate for income. So let's talk about a public performance since that is the biggest piece. That's defined in section 101 of the Copyright Act and you can read it there and it's performed either directly or by means of a process or a device by transmission. So streaming is a public performance, uh, radio, TV, ca cable and satellite are public performances. So again, what are examples of public performances? So anywhere there's live music in a concert hall or an arena, jukeboxes as uh, radio, TV, streaming, background music in restaurants and bars, musical attractions. If you go to a theme park, if you go to a zoo and there's music, chances are that has to be licensed. And who licenses this? Because no songwriter or music publisher can go to uh, the thousands of radio stations and bars and restaurants and zoos and go licensing this. So that is what the performing rights organizations are for, otherwise known as PROs. And who are they? Uh, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and uh, a recent entry into the biz, uh, Global Music Rights uh, GMR. So what do they do? They license and monitor and collect fees and distribute royalties on behalf of non-dramatic public performances of musical works. So they don't represent artists and labels, they represent songwriters and music publishers. And the performing rights organizations are unique in that they pay the songwriter members directly and that's called the writer's share and they pay the publishers directly, that's called the publisher's share. And it's basically a 50-50 split. All the other income streams that we were talking about before Those are paid generally to the publisher who then accounts to the songwriter under his or her songwriter agreement. So, non-dramatic public performances. The PROs do not license things like operas, musical theater works, and choreographic works. So if it's a ballet and you're using copyrighted music, obviously if it's public domain like Mozart or Chopin, you don't need the license. But if it's copyrighted work, um, the performing rights organizations don't license that. Those are licensed directly by the copyright owners, typically the music publishers. How do the PROs license? They typically issue what's called a blanket license, which is an all-you-can-eat buffet, um, which means if they have an ASCAP license, for example, they license the licensee for a set fee, can use any or all of the works in the ASCAP repertory in whole or in part as often as you like. So it's uh, a pretty good uh, way to cover the, the marketplace. ASCAP and BMI are by far the biggest in, in the uh, PRO biz. Between the two of them, they have over 90% of the marketplace and they operate under consent decrees which have been in existence for uh, decades since 1941. And under these consent decrees, if a licensee uh, and the ASCAP or BMI can't agree on a license, all the licensee has to do is submit a letter to the court that oversees the consent decree. In both cases, it's the Southern District of New York. And they are automatically licensed until there is a proceeding that uh, determines the rate for the uh, licensee. So to a certain extent, public performances are operating on a de facto compulsory license. Now there are certain exemptions, exceptions to uh, public performance, such as face-to-face -face teaching, religious services, some nonprofit events. There's not a broad nonprofit exemption. Uh, for example, no fee can be charged and the performers can't be paid. So 
I suggest if you're thinking that an exemption might apply, there's another exemption that applies to bars and restaurants if they're only using radio over speakers. It doesn't apply to uh, live performances. Look at the 110 exemptions very carefully. Now, let's talk about one of the other major uh, income sources of publishers, mechanical licenses. The term mechanical license goes back to the days of piano rolls where it was an actual mechanical reproduction of the song. And that term has carried over from piano rolls to 78s to LPs to 45s uh, to CDs, cassettes, and, and, and downloads. So if you want to do a cover of a song, you can get a compulsory license and as long as you pay the statutory rate, which is currently 9.1 cents for a song five minutes or less, you can record that song and the publisher, uh, the copyright owner, can't say no as long as you comply with the Section 115 mechanical license provisions. And generally it applies to cover songs only, but very often in practice, even though the statute doesn't apply, to first recordings very often in accordance with artist recording contracts. First recordings will be licensed in a very similar manner and the statutory rate will be a ceiling of what will be paid for songwriter royalties and mechanical royalties are songwriter royalties for use in audio only sound recordings. Sync licenses, these are voluntarily negotiated for when you use a work in film, TV, advertising, etc. And if you're using pre-recorded music, let's say you want to use a Taylor Swift song in a movie, you have to get permission of the copyright owner of the underlying musical work, which would be Taylor Swift's music publisher, and you have to get permission of the copyright owner of the particular recording, which would be Taylor Swift's label. Let's talk about what a publisher does. Obviously, they have to maintain song files and who gets paid the royalties and copyright registrations. They prosecute and defend infringements. They give advances. All the business things that you would expect a publisher to do. Key points for music publisher agreements, a lot of these will apply to recording artist agreements with a record label as well. The term, the territory, what songs are actually being covered. Are there advances? Advances are always recoupable against royalties. What do you have to deliver? How many songs do you have to deliver during the term? And copyright ownership. Does the publisher own it? Does the songwriter own it? Something in between. The administration writes, the, does the songwriter have a right to audit the performance? Reps and warranties are very important. Uh, and these apply in recording contracts as well, whether the work you have to represent, the songwriter represents that the work is original and that it doesn't infringe on any third parties. And hand in hand with the reps and warranties would be an indemnification provision. Obviously, like many contracts, there's a choice of law, a choice of forum. So music publishing contracts. The traditional music publishing agreement, which still exists in a lot of areas, is a songwriter writes a song enters into a contract with the publisher and assigns 100% of the copyright to the life of the copyright and the songwriter and the publisher divide the royalties 50-50. Uh, that's the writer's share and the publisher's share except for print because there's physical product. Print royalties are generally in the 10 to 12 and a half percent range. So it's an outright assignment of copyright for life of the copyright. An admin agreement is the opposite. The songwriter or songwriters keep the copyright, but the administrating publisher stands in the shoes and handles all the licensing and Section 106 rights, and they collect anywhere between 5% to 25% off the top, depending upon how active the publisher is at administering. A co-publishing agreement is a hybrid of the traditional contract and the um, administration agreement. That's where a songwriter retains part of his or her copyright. So the songwriter may obtain, may assign 
50% of the copyright and retain the remaining 50% of the copyright. And if you think about the songwriter's share and the publisher's share, so if you have $100 of income, $50 would be the publisher's share, $50 would be the writer's share. If it's a co-publishing agreement where they keep 50% of the income, the, uh, you, the, the songwriter is getting an, another 50% of the publisher's share, so they're getting more of the income, they're retaining some copyright ownership. A sub-publishing agreement is a form of administration agreement where a publisher enters into an agreement with a foreign publisher to license the work uh, overseas. Uh, it could be for a worldwide, except for the U.S., it can be Europe, it can be country by country. Let's talk about record labels. They represent recording artists, and sometimes, but not always, recording artists are songwriters. So they provide, they discover artists, they provide capital, production, distribute product, which in this digital age and where streaming is so important, uh, physical product is less important, but they provide promotion, they provide tour support, and again, they operate uh, in accordance with a contract between the label and the artist. So some of these terms are familiar from recording contracts. The recording commitment is very important. It could be a number of songs, it could be a number of albums. We're moving away from albums to number of songs or, uh, or even number of minutes. Advances are always recoupable. Anything that the label shells out is an advance. Typically, these days, they supply a recording fund to the artist who hires the producer and the musicians and the recording studio and engineer. Anything that's left is their personal advance, and that's recoupable against artist royalties. As you see, the royalties are typically in the 13 to 20% range for sales. If it's a licensing deal, such as a sync license, that would be a 50-50 split. So let's say, for example, the artist has a 15% royalty rate and um, the uh, artist was fronted $250,000 to record a, uh, an album and a million dollars comes into the record company. At a 15% royalty rate, that artist has recouped $150,000 and even though a million dollars has come in, that artist is still unrecouped uh, until there's further sales. Why? Because record labels, A, have more bargaining power than most artists, and B, the 80-20 rule applies here as in other places. For every hit artist and hit recording that a record label has, they're going to have a lot of losses that never recoup. Again, we talked about the label owning the work as a work for hire. Controlled composition clause is something that limits the amount of mechanical royalties that is paid out. Those get very complicated. They're less important now uh, with streaming than it was with physical product, but they're in every, uh, they are in every recording contract. The audio verification code for this course is VIEW, V-I-E-W, VIEW. The audio verification code for this course is VIEW, V-I-E-W, VIEW. So, let's talk about um, the streaming services. They have to license the public performance from the PROs. In addition, there are server copies that are physical reproductions and that is a mechanical reproduction and that has to be licensed as well. Again, we go back to the Section 106 rights. There are two different rights. Public performance is different from reproduction and distribution. 
So the PROs will license the public performance and the labels or through some kind of collective such as Merlin or Sound Exchange, which we'll talk about in a second, will license the mechanical aspect. Now, with respect to streaming, there is a difference between interactive and non-interactive and there are some compulsory licenses for the streaming of the sound recording public performance. Remember, way, way back in one of the early slides, there is a limited public performing right in the sound recording. So let's briefly talk about that. When New York, New York gets played over the loudspeakers at Yankee Stadium or on the radio, Kander and Ebb and their music publisher get paid royalties through BMI. The estate of Frank Sinatra and his record label get nothing. Zero zip bupkis because there is no broad public performing right in a sound recording. The United States is fairly unique in that among the only other countries that don't have a broad right in a public uh, performance in a sound recording are North Korea and Iran. So the only public performing right in a sound recording is for transmission, digital audio transmission, meaning streaming. So if it's played on the radio, the artist and the record label get nothing. If it's played over loudspeakers at a, an arena, the artist and the record label get nothing, but the songwriters always get paid. The reason for this is the record la the radio stations had significant bargaining power and still do. Every congressional district in the country has at least one radio station. And when uh, Congress people are up for re-election, they uh, often advertise on radio and TV. Uh, there's no public performance in a sound recording for a terrestrial broadcast on TV either. So they said that we're providing promotion for the sales of your recordings. And that was a very valid argument for a long time when sales of LPs and CDs were coined of, of the realm. But in a streaming environment, it's certainly less so. And there's always pressure to uh, lobby Congress to have a broader right in sound recording. Now, Sound Exchange operates like a performing rights organization, like an ASCAP or a BMI, for the public performing right in streaming for the sound recordings. And those are covered by Section 112 and Section 114 of the Copyright Act. However, they license only non-interactive services that, where you can't select a song on demand that basically operates like um, uh, an internet radio station. And Sound Exchange also pays labels, artists, side artists, uh, and, and producers but they have a limited function. The other rights for interactive services have to be negotiated, as I mentioned, directly with the labels or a licensing entity such as Merlin that licenses on behalf of labels. Let's talk about the Music Modernization Act, which went into, a, which was signed into law at the end of 2018 and is still in the process of being implemented. One of the most important things that it does is that it creates a new blanket mechanical license for uh, downloads and interactive streaming. So if you are starting a streaming service like Spotify or Pandora, you don't want to license individual songs on a song by song basis, which is how mechanical licenses had always been issued. You want something like what the PROs do, a blanket license. That didn't happen. There wasn't a mechanism for that. So what the services did is they would send notices of intent to the Copyright Office saying, we're applying for a blanket license. The Copyright Office was overwhelmed. And even where the copyright, uh, where the services knew who the copyright owners were, if it's Prince or Taylor Swift or Drake, you kind of can find who owns the copyrights for their songs. Um, people weren't getting paid. Lawsuits were being filed. Enter the Music Modernization Act. So 
it creates a new blanket license for streaming services and it creates a new mechanical licensing collective that will create a database for uh, licensing these mechanical rights under the, uh, the, the Music Modernization Act. And the database is being paid by the streaming services. Why are they paying for it? Because they're getting uh, a waiver of infringement liability. That was the Faustine bargain that was struck. So now, once the MMA goes into effect, the streaming services will be able to get blanket licenses for the mechanical rights on their server copies. And, but they still have to get public performing rights for the songs from the uh, performing rights organizations. It makes, the MMA also makes changes. It changes the mechanical licensing rate, which is set by the Copyright Royalty Board, from a uh, specific standard to a fair market standard, willing buyer, willing seller. It changes the ASCAP consent decrees from being overseen by a single judge, currently uh, Judge Stanton for BMI and Judge Cote for ASCAP, to like every other case, so it would be a wheel rotation. And believe it or not, sound recordings prior to 1972, or February 15, 1972, to be exact, weren't protected by the Federal Copyright Act. So there were a couple of cases in the last few years where uh, entities like Pandora and Spotify said, well, you have this federal copyright right to be paid for the public performance, the streaming in the sound recording, but your pre-72 recordings, which is you know, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Frank Sinatra, uh, so many jazz country recordings, you don't get paid. Lawsuits followed, the MMA uh, was enacted, and now there is a certain amount of federalization for these uh, pre-72 sound recordings, and this allows, to be, this allows artists and labels to be paid for the streaming public performances um, for the older recordings. And it applies the infringement re remedies under the Copyright Act and, and certain exemptions as well. What else does the Music Modernization Act do? And a lot of the Music Modernization Act is contained in Section 115, which is the mechanical licensing provision. When I got out of law school many, many years ago, Section 115 was less than a page in the Copyright Act. Section 115 now is now more than 30 pages, or about 30 pages, because it has all these provisions of the Music Modernization Act, including the creation of the Mechanical Licensing Collective, who serves on the board. Um, it, it consists mostly of music publishers, but it does have some songwriters. There's oversight committees. There's a budgeting process for the operating budget for the Mechanical Licensing Collective. And that's all been added to the Copyright Act. So what else does the Music Modernization Act do? Well, there is the AMP Act, which allows producers, engineers, and mixers to be paid directly by sound exchange. Prior to the enactment of the MMA, these uh, individuals who have a, a vital contribution to uh, sound recordings, the only way they could get paid was by contract with either the label or more commonly with the artist, uh, him or herself, and they had to send a letter of direction and it was a complicated and convoluted process and it came out of the artist's share and now the Music Modernization Act provides that sound exchange can pay these uh, participants directly. One of the main things that is going to be uh, of great discussion and there's a lot of ink in the popular press uh, in publications such as Billboard and Hollywood Reporter and Digital Music News and all sorts of things is the implementation issues. 
who's on the board, who's running the show, what oversight do uh, individual songwriters have. Uh, there are limited audit rights with respect to the actual music licensing collective. And the most important thing is who's building the database? A lot of music entities like the PROs, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, they all have databases uh, of songs. The foreign equivalents of ASCAP and BMI um, have databases. Streaming, as we know, knows no geographic boundaries. It's international. So who's building it? And more importantly, what data is going to be put in and what format does this data uh, take? The Music Modernization Act does have certain provisions as to a minimum of what needs to be included in the, in the database, but there are all sorts of identifiers uh, that music publishers and songwriters also want to include. And then there is the question of how is this database going to interact with all sorts of existing databases? This remains to be seen. The licensing collective and the blanket licensing and all that does not go into effect until uh, next year. And it's going to be, I predict, something of a hot mess because this new database, this new licensing collective has to be built in a relatively short period of time. There were competing bids as to who the mechanical licensing collective would be. That was only decided by the Copyright Office over the summer. So only since the summer has the winning entity uh, been designated the music licensing collective and they now have to hire staff, hire uh, contractors to build the database and have that all ready to go and throw the switch next year and well we saw what happened with new apps in the uh, Iowa caucus so think about the complexity of what's being designed here and the interactivity with other databases, all the streaming services and the record labels and especially the music publishers. That is going to be uh, very interesting next year. Let's talk about music clearances. That's when you secure permission to use pre-existing musical works or pre-existing sound recordings. We talked a little bit about that with sync licensing. Sampling also involves clearances. It doesn't pertain to creating new music. If you hire a composer to create a new work, that's commissioned music, you don't need clearances. If you're licensing for something in a film or TV show, very often uh, the music supervisor will come to you and you'll say, if I'm a music publisher, for example, I'm licensing on a most favored nation's basis. So that means that I want the same deal that similarly situated licensees work. So if I have a 10 second background instrumental in a film and another publisher has a 10 second background instrumental, I want the same deal. Very often the publisher will say, I want to be licensed on a favored nation's basis with the owner of the sound recording. So going back to the Taylor Swift example, if you want to use Taylor Swift, you have to use, you have to get permission for both the publisher and the record label and very often they'll say we want the same deal because nobody wants to make a bad deal. Sync clearances, the music publisher, uh, the publisher and the record label will both be asking the same thing. What's the nature of the project? How is it being used? Is it uh, being used over the title credits or is it just you know a background instrumental? Obviously over the title credits commands a higher fee. What's the duration of the license? What's the territory worldwide or only US? Those, so as you see on the slide, those are some of the considerations. 
Music sampling is kind of like an audio-only sync license. You're taking a portion of one sound recording and putting it into another. So you would need the permission of both the, the sound recording owner, which is the record label, and you also need the permission of the copyright owner of the underlying song. So you need the permission of the music publishers and the permission of the label to include a sample in your recording. You don't get a fair, you, no sampling is fair use. There's a very famous decision, Grand Upright Music, which was a, a sampling case, and it starts with, thou shalt not steal. So you can see where that was going, and that case basically created the cottage industry of clearing samples, and that was Judge Duffy back in 1991. So let's say I want to clear a song. How do I find publisher information? ASCAP and BMI have publisher information on their database. And so you can search by title, songwriter, artist. You generally won't know the publisher because that's what you're looking for. And a song may have several publishers. Uh, it's always helpful to contact the, the largest publisher first to see if they administer on behalf of the others. So we're coming to the end of our program. And let's say you want more information about the Copyright Act and registrations. There's a lot of information at copyright.gov. Um, and if you want more information about other forms of intellectual property, Patent and Trademark Office, and of course, law line classes on other uh, IP rights and, and publicity rights. So for those of you who want to take an even deeper dive, I have a lot of information on my website. As I mentioned, I have blog posts on the benefits of copyright registration, blog posts about fair use, uh, collaborations and derivative works and arrangements. And if you want to take a very deep dive, Cone on Music Licensing is uh, the uh, treat leading treatise in the area. The Copyright Office issued its music licensing report in 2015. Very good uh, primer with uh, lots of uh, citations on the music licensing landscape. And finally, if you have very specific questions about copyrightability and registrations, the Compendium of Copyright Office pra Practices is available for free online at the Copyright Office website. So that wraps up our presentation for today. And I hope you learned something about music law. And I thank you for your time.